December 10, 1945, police enter an apartment at 3941 North Pine Grove Avenue in Chicago. They discover the body of a woman lying over a bathtub, a bread knife stuck in her neck. In the living room, there's a message on the wall scribbled in lipstick. For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. This wasn't the first time the killer had struck. In June of that same year, the cops walked into an apartment at 4108 North Kenmore Avenue in Chicago. There they found the body of a 43-year-old Josephine Ross. There had been no forced entry. Seems the killer had let himself in through the back door in the early hours of the morning. The woman had been killed while sleeping. Her jugular vein had been cut right through. The killer had then carried the body to the bathroom, where he had proceeded to clean it in the bathtub. The cops found it still filled with water, now a shade of crimson. Bloodied towels floated on the surface. The killer had then taken her back to her bed. He bandaged her injuries as if he felt sorry for her. A skirt was placed over her head, and a stocking hid the wounds to her throat. The killer had spent close to two hours in the apartment after the murder. He cleaned traces of his fingerprints, which suggests he was forensically aware, a term investigators would use years later. His next victim was found with the haunting message scrawled on the wall. She was 31-year-old Frances Brown. When she was discovered half hanging onto the bathtub, cops again found blood-stained towels nearby. To hide her wounds, the killer at this time put pajamas over her head. Only when they lifted them up did they see the bread knife firmly planted in her neck. The victim had also been shot, once in the arm and once in the side of the head. The killer had taken his time with the cleanup job, carefully wiping the body down with soap and water. He'd also used tape to cover her wounds. Perhaps in his twisted mind he thought he was fixing her. Or perhaps different personalities inhabited this crazed man's brain. A savage, heartless killer who after the fact turned into a repentant criminal. What astounded police is just how this killer had gotten into her apartment. He performed quite a dangerous stunt by jumping from a fire escape high up down to her narrow window ledge. He could quite easily have fallen to his death. Cops knew now they were looking for someone who was not your everyday criminal. And that message? It sent shivers down the investigators' spines. Did this maniac really want to be stopped? Could he not suppress the urge to kill? He'd been meticulous in cleaning the apartment, but he'd left a clue. On the door jamb that he'd touched with his bloodied hand, he left a fingerprint. On January 6, 1946, a girl named Suzanne Degnan was abducted from an apartment at 5943 North Kenmore Avenue. The police discovered that the perpetrator had used a ladder to get to her bedroom window. In the bedroom was a ransom letter, scribbled on an old piece of oil-stained paper. Like the cops had seen before, the capital letters were all over the place. What would also become a matter of importance was the fact that there were spelling mistakes. The note said, Get $20,000 ready and wait for word. Do not notify FBI or police. Bills in fives and tens. Burn this for her safety. The next day, some patrol cops were looking for the missing girl when they came upon something strange looking in a sewer basin. They had to scrunch up their eyes. What they thought they saw was a large doll's head. The yellow hair of the doll was lying in the dirty sewer water. It wasn't a doll, it was the severed head of Suzanne. More police searched the nearby area, places just a stone's throw away from where she'd been abducted. In no time at all, they found one of her legs in another sewer. Soon after, they discovered another leg. Her torso was found later in a storm basin. It took the police a month to find her arms. Again, what was strange is that the killer had gone to great lengths to wipe all the blood from the body parts. Cops assumed that the body had been dismembered close to where the parts were found in a laundry room. Close to that room, police found a bit of wire that's been used to make a noose. Still connected to it were strands of the victim's hair. The murders had all happened in close proximity or close enough. The modus operandi was the same in the first two murders and similar in the third. It didn't take a rocket scientist to connect the killings, but still, police had to act with caution when joining the dots. For instance, if the killer was the same guy, how come he'd abducted one victim and killed her later? Why had he changed? Then the police saw some other dots forming on the bloody horizon. They discovered that a 19-year-old woman had been shot in the arm as an assailant tried to get her through her bedroom window. The location of the crime was close to where the murders had taken place. Just days after that, a very nimble and acrobatic man had climbed up onto the roof of an apartment and dropped through a skylight like Spider-Man might have done, if he were inclined to criminality. That girl was named Evelyn Peterson, and she lived to tell the tale. The assailant had hit her over the head, and after tying her with a lamp cord, he rifled through the things in her apartment, but this time he decided not to kill the victim. He just left her there. She was later discovered by her sister who'd gone to her apartment for lunch. Just as the sister entered the apartment block, she saw a young man. 
she remembered his face because he was quite a handsome fella, possibly in his late teens. She was locked out of hers and her sister's apartment, so the guy told her he'd try to help her get in. Her sister at this point was still unconscious. That teenage boy banged and banged on the apartment door. After a few minutes, Evelyn answered. Her hands were still partly tied, and her face was covered in blood. The teen held her in his arms and asked her if she was okay. She wasn't, of course, so he guided her back into the apartment where he said he'd help her clean up. The guy then went downstairs and told the superintendent to go and help the girl. He said she'd been beaten up pretty bad. The kid then just took off, not even leaving his name. Police found the girl in a state of shock. She was still trembling, only half conscious. On looking at the skylight where the intruder had entered, they made another grisly discovery. The perpetrator had for some reason taken a dump right before he'd swooped down into the room. It was also reported that another young woman was just sitting in her room when she was attacked. This time, someone shot at her through the kitchen window. She was injured in the arm, but it was only a graze. The perpetrator subsequently fled. All these attacks were similar, and all happened close to each other. Surely there had to be a connection. This became a huge case in the US media. The term split personality wasn't part of most cops' vocabulary back then, but it seemed that there was a possibility that one man had committed all the crimes, but perhaps that man was somehow mentally divided. He killed and he cleaned, as if trying to recuperate his morality after a monstrous outburst. It was reminiscent of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There was also a hint of Jack the Ripper in the case. The coroner told the reporters that the killer had formidable surgical skills. He said the murderer was a man who worked in a profession that required the study of anatomy or one with a background in dissection. Not even the average doctor could be as skillful. The newspaper the Madeira Tribune wrote that one of the greatest manhunts was now taking place. The paper said the number one suspect was a 65-year-old janitor who worked at the apartment where the body had been dismembered. And that couldn't have been more wrong. The paper wrote that residents had come out in support of him and he said he was a good-natured grandfather who'd never do such a thing. The manhunt continued. Then things got crazy a few months later. A caretaker of another apartment was being especially careful since there had been a bunch of burglaries at his apartment. Every night he prowled around the place making sure no one got inside who didn't have a key. On the night of June 26, 1947, the caretaker came across a suspicious-looking young man. When he approached the man, a gun was pulled, but the man soon fled. He was spotted not too far away by police, but when approached this time, the guy tried to shoot. Lucky for the cops, the gun didn't work correctly and they soon had the guy down on the floor. That wasn't easy. This guy, no older than a teenager, was certainly a nimble fella, and he was also strong. Just as soon as the cops thought they had him secured to the floor, the athletic teen somehow slipped out of their grip got hold of one of the cops' guns. Another cop then jumped on and managed to stop the kid from firing the gun, but again the kid fought like a lion. One of the cops took drastic measures, picking up a heavy clay flower pot and smashing it over the teen's head. It should have knocked him out cold. It didn't even seem to bother him, so the cop smashed another three flower pots on his head. Only now was the teen subdued. Who was this kid who had the strength of two men and the acrobatic ability to match anyone who worked in the circus? His name was William Hirons, and he was just 17 years old. When he wasn't taking on policemen in the streets, he was a student at the University of Chicago where his impressive intelligence had got him onto special learning programs for talented students. He was popular, too, especially with the girls. Young Bill was quite the looker, and he had the mouth to match his facial fortunes. But it turned out that Bill had a checkered past. In his early teens, he committed scores of burglaries, but he never sold the stuff he stole. He just kept all the things, so when cops went to his apartment when he was 13, they found a stash that looked like a veritable Aladdin's cave. If he'd sold the items in today's cash, he would have gotten about $60,000. His crimes weren't about money. Bill was sent to a school for wayward boys after that. Even though he stole again and again, just for the fun of it, he became an exceptional student. So when his former teachers and schoolmates found out that he'd been arrested at 17 for fighting with cops, they couldn't believe it. He was a good kid, smart as a whip. He got on with everyone. When that first murder was committed, Bill was studying, but he also had a job as a laborer for the Chicago Railroad. On the day the murder happened, he hadn't turned up for work. When the second murder was committed, he was already at Chicago University. There, girls flirted with him constantly. He was also a member of many clubs, ominously, the Gun Club. When police took this guy in, they didn't immediately think he was behind any of the murders. What they had in their interrogation room was just a good-looking kid who had no doubt done a bit of wrestling in his time. But then they searched his dorm room. Now he had a lot of explaining to do. 
They found jewelry, guns, watches, and other items worth a considerable amount of money. They even found photos of well-known Nazi leaders. On top of that, they discovered war bonds that were worth over $20,000 in today's cash. Police were given another shock when Bill told them he'd take them to a locker he kept at the Howard Street L station. There, they found more war bonds, worth over $100,000 in today's money, and this was a kid that on the outside looked poor. Then he told them about more of his stashes, and in the end, police found items and bonds worth over $1.1 million in today's money. He hadn't spent any of it. As serial killer historian Peter Vronsky points out in his book, American Serial Killers, the burglaries were purely pathological. Notably, one of the stolen items found was the book Psychopathia Sexualis, a treatise on sexual deviance. But murder, dismemberment, that was a whole different ballgame. Still, fingerprints found at the murder scenes matched those of Bill. The crimes had also taken place close to where he lived. Then witnesses came forward and gave positive IDs. Vronsky writes in his book, But Hirons wasn't talking. He just lay strapped in his bed, staring blankly into space. Frustrated, Chicago police allegedly roughed up the teen, slamming his bandaged head into a wall in the hope that it would help his memory. It didn't. Now things get even stranger if you thought they weren't already strange enough. Police tortured him. They gave him truth serum. Quite unbelievably, they gave him a spinal tap without an anesthetic. This was Middle Ages stuff, and Bill didn't have a lawyer present during any of the interrogations. The police were desperate to get their man due to the public outcry, but as we now know, this pressure can lead cops to do things that usually only criminals are capable of. Nonetheless, it was shown that Bill misspelled words the same as some of the words had been misspelled in that ransom letter. He had the loot from many burglaries close to the murders. Those Nazi photos had been stolen down the street from where the girl had been abducted. He also fit the witness's description of the killer. It all seemed to point to his guilt. At one point, he made a deal with the prosecutor to plead guilty if the death penalty wasn't imposed. Then later, Bill changed his mind. He confessed and changed his mind on a number of occasions. Meanwhile, his mother said, he's still our son and we'll stand by him. He still got life in prison, but he always said he was innocent and had been subjected to police torture. Once, when asked how much pain the murdered girl felt, he replied, I can't tell you if she suffered. I didn't kill her. Tell Mr. Degnan to please look after his other daughter because whoever killed Suzanne is still out there. Was he telling the truth? Well, over the years, he had a huge number of supporters that all called for his release. They said he was a victim of a police conspiracy. They said Bill was nothing more than a burglar fitted up for a crime when police found themselves cornered by immense public pressure. Human rights advocates later said his guilt or innocence is not the only major factor in the case. A miscarriage of justice took place when the police tortured the teenager. A petition said there had been prosecutorial misconduct, prejudice during the trial, junk science used, a terrible defense counsel, and more. He might have killed those people, but in a world that espouses an ethical justice system, he would have never gone to prison. Even in the 2000s, when Bill was an elderly man behind prison walls, people still fought for his release. Vronsky, who's investigated the case as much as anyone, says one thing pointing to his guilt is the fact that he knew things only the murderer could have known, such as the use of a certain hunting knife to chop up the girl. Vronsky writes that Bill was almost definitely a psychopath, which perhaps was the result of a severe head injury when he was a kid. This seemed to change his behavior. After he was first imprisoned, doctors noted that this kid was inarguably abnormal. They said he had a very unusual tolerance for pain. Doctors shoved pins into his feet and under his nails, and he felt nothing at all. He didn't even flinch. This might explain his high wire jumps and his uncanny ability to fight through flower pot bashings. He may have also lost the ability to sympathize, to feel pain mentally, and that's why he cleaned down the bodies. It might be why he didn't always kill his victims, and why he wrote that message on the wall. Notably, he told doctors his favorite movie was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In some of his confessions, he admitted to having blackouts and then coming around throwing body parts into the sewer. He said that happened after he dismembered the girl. That's why he threw a ransom note through the window after. He felt bad. He wanted the parents to think their daughter was still alive, to give them hope. He also said once he had an accomplice, a man named George Merman, but police could find no such man. It's likely he didn't exist. George was Bill's father's name. Merman could have stood for a murder man. Maybe George was Mr. Hyde and Bill was Dr. Jekyll. Vronsky wrote that since the age of nine, Bill was a spinning wheel of paraphilic transgressive actions. In layman's terms, that means he did things society deems as wrong, and there was usually a sexual element to his deeds. 
If he didn't commit those murders, he was certainly a man on the edge and very likely a complete psychopath. Vronsky thinks he probably did commit those murders. Still, terrible police work and a cruel and corrupt justice system didn't do the job it's paid by the public to do. For that reason, we just can't be sure of his guilt. There's also pretty strong evidence that another man could have committed the murders. He was Richard Russell Thomas. He died in prison in 1974, and strangely, all records of his interrogation about the Chicago murders died with him. On February 26, 2012, William Hirons died in prison from complications of his diabetes. He was 83, and one of the longest serving prisoners in US history. Now you need to watch why this generation will have more serial killers than ever, or have a look at this.